I'm going to discuss some of the ideas, and I'd very much like some feedback from you as we go, some, some of your own ideas. Um, my personal history is that I was uh, a, before I founded Sparkle, I was an engineer at Google for three years, so I've done a, a lot of software engineering. Before that, I ran my own company producing a web system in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, so any, any sort of uh, bloomers or bloopers I make about networking, please let me know, because I'm not necessarily so experienced on the networking side. I'm, I'm more of a software engineer. But when we did this thing of producing the sequencing engine, um, we came across the uh, capability it had for provisioning as it goes. And, and that obviously um, had applications in software-defined networking. So I, I've learned a bit about networking. But anything you can help me uh, with that would be good. Um, I'd like to know a bit about the group today, just so that I um, you know, don't teach uh, grandmothers to suck eggs. So, um, can I ask of, of who's here? Who is a, an engineer in the networking sense, so a networking engineer? OK. Um, and how many people here are, are managers? OK, I've got my eye on you. Um, and, and who uh, is a regular coder in uh, JavaScript uh, or any other language? OK, or um, an occasional coder? OK, we got uh, a colleague of mine at the back as well. OK, this is really good. Um, so, uh, the title of the talk is Unifying Application Logic with Infrastructure. Um, and what I want to do first uh, is go through how it is that infrastructure and applications have grown up strangers um, when really they're very closely related and how we can get this, these sort of uh, brothers and sisters back together again and turn them into, into one happy family. Um, now, a few years ago, the idea of unifying application logic and infrastructure or data center automation would have made absolutely no sense. Um, uh, but what's happened recently in network function virtualization, uh, in software-defined networking, compute and storage, means that we're now able to control data center automation with software. And therefore, it must surely be possible to bring the flow of the application and the automation uh, back together so they're one and the same thing. So let's take a closer look at where we are today and how we got there. Um, actually, before doing that, let me just explain a couple of terms I'm going to use here. So what I want to do is explain where we are and how we got there, but I also want to talk about this thing. I don't know how many of you are involved in enterprise IT like at the business level, um, some people, which is good. But we have, I think, a black box issue, and I want to talk to you about that. And I want to explain to you why I think we need a clear box to resolve some of the black box issues. And I'm going to use this term black box swamp. Just keep that in your mind, and I'd quite like to get your feedback on whether you think this is a, a good phrase to use or not. Um, finally, I'll give you some demos and examples of how I think we can approach this. Um, so in the beginning, uh, we had uh, the uh, uh, separation, if you like, which was a physical separation between the applications and the um, uh, infrastructure. So before you even thought of running an app, you had to unpack the boxes, you had to get out your Torx drivers, uh, screw in your hard disk drives, get partitioning. After you've partitioned your hard disk, install your apps, uh, your operating system, sorry, then install your app. Um, and in the fullness of time, uh, after you'd configured the connections, you'd got your Ethernet sorted out, uh, you could uh, get the whole thing going. And I used to run a business doing this uh, quite a long time ago. So we had this physical infrastructure you could drop on your foot and it hurt. But since then, some things have changed. Um, one of the first things is the virtualization of servers themselves. So we have virtual servers, whether Linux or other operating systems, and then virtualization within that. So we have Docker containers and other mechanisms of deploying uh, compute platforms. Um, and in the meantime, the network devices themselves have started to exhibit uh, programmability. We have network function virtualization. Um, and we also have the ability to program the individual capabilities like routes or um, uh, interfaces or whatever on individual routers. Um, so I find it easier when describing all this just to talk about software-defined everything. 
um, network storage, compute, and management. But there are many different you know, fine-tuned cases and examples which make different terminology work better under different circumstances. So if we look at version two of this picture, which is what we have today, it's really very similar. The only difference is we have software to find everything. Um, and underneath, uh, we have, oh, obviously infinite bandwidth, zero latency, and 100% reliable physical network. That goes without saying. And all the network engineers here will agree that's what they provide. Um, now, for Cisco, in my view, this rising tide of virtualization uh, represented an interesting dichotomy. Server virtualization was a great opportunity for them because it enabled them to enter a market that they hadn't really got into before um, and invade, as it were, the market space of existing players. But the other side of software defined, I think, represented a threat to Cisco, um, the commoditization of network kit uh, through uh, SDM programmability and the virtualization of it. Um, represented a threat to expensive custom kit. But luckily, the rate of SDN adoption, I think, was much slower than people expected. Um, the key problem was security, in many people's eyes. Um, once you write an application, it's got bugs. If a buggy application is controlling a network, what have you got? You've got an insecure network. And I think a lot of people were really frightened by that idea. So potential security holes and what have you, I think slowed down the, the wholesale adoption of software-defined networking. And I think this turned out really well for Cisco. Um, it slowed the rate of commoditization and enabled them to produce or refine a story, uh, which I think now works really well, notably to provide commercially supported versions of open source software. So that, that's things like um, OpenSDN controller. Uh, so I think that's pretty ideal for customers, and it's worked out well so far. So we find ourselves now approaching things with a DevOps view. Uh, we have the software-defined compute storage and network. We have uh, orchestration tools of one sort or another, which allow us to deploy services and infrastructural components for given apps. Um, we've got open daylight controller and so on. So all of these are able to automate the deployment of architectures or stacks required to run or test applications. So we design applications like we used to. Um, but we run them now on infrastructure, which is often provisioned uh, through use of tools, uh, scripts, GUI tools, and so forth. But the key thing is that the division between the application and the infrastructure is fundamentally unchanged. And if you were to talk to application developers about how they do stuff, not much is different to how it was in the days when we had physical networks. In a way, it's about speed. So we're able to deploy these networks and the infrastructure quicker thanks to the tools we've got. And that, that's good, but it's not fundamentally changing the way things work. The idea of DevOps, though, is to bring these two layers together so that we have one team, application developers and operations people, um, and they collaborate to uh, combine the development and infrastructure operations. Now, if you imagine the ideal DevOps team, you can hear the conversations between the guys in, uh, who are producing the stack with Chef and Puppet, uh, the ops guys and the network guys. So not much has changed, although the cogs have. This would have come no surprise to this guy, Conway, who said very famously a long time ago, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. In other words, we do stuff that reflects how we're organized. Um, and I think quite a lot of what's happening today reflects that reality. The question is, does it matter? And I think the answer is, yes, it does. Because there is an overarching problem over these technical developments for businesses um, which is not about how any one app gets deployed. It's about how the combination of apps gets deployed. And it's the combinatorial problems when you've got hundreds of apps or even thousands of apps. Or in the case of one bank I visited uh, last week, they say they got 6,500 applications. So it's not about one app and the deployment. Um, it's about the combinatorial problem of loads of apps. So 
even with our new virtualization, we've got a problem which is about what the chief executive of a big organization with complex systems, how he feels about this stuff. And how he feels is pretty much the same now uh, as it used to be. New stuff gets rolled out quicker, virtualization enables that, but the result is still a sticky mess of black box systems. So one of the approaches we're developing, or all of us are developing, to deal with this is something we call microservices, and I'm sure people have heard of this. Um, the idea being to divide and conquer by deploying independent, uh, self-contained components that work together in combinations to do whatever is needed for a business. So an application, a process, a transaction, or whatever. And the idea is not new. So this was, uh, well, it's similar, really, to co-routines that we had in BCPL 40 years ago. Um, but it's a great idea. Um, and it allows each service to be developed, tested, and deployed independently of the others. You might have one component which is written in JavaScript and deployed on Node.js, and another that's written in Java and deployed on uh, a J2E stack. And that's, that's a great way of mixing technologies to deliver a, a single app. But the question remains, uh, what constitutes the application itself? The, the answer is always some programmed entity, so pr some program you've written. And in a microservices environment, that might itself be a microservice. So now consider the view from the top. We're now looking at services here, which are independently deployed some of which have got an orchestration function, i.e. they combine other services together. Um, if you split stuff up like this, the problem that we end up with is, do we know that orchestration is done in here? Do we know whether these services have a choreography between them? Can we be sure that this service is actually needed? And answering those questions matters to a business. To an individual who's managing one app, it doesn't matter. But to a business, it really matters. Because they have this soup of black boxes with interdependencies where the expense lies in knowing how it all works and what the side effects are when you change stuff. So the soup of black boxes creates a swamp which limits the agility and the flexibility of a business. And to the guys at the top, that really matters. So um, these problems, which are, are really about metadata, it's about how do you describe the service and what, what's in it, are very similar to the problems that programmers have already had just combining libraries. Um, so if you have source code, you use uh, dependency analysis to bring in the right libraries and compile an app so that it all works. And the other thing with this is that we still have this chasm between the communications network itself, which remember is 100% reliable, uh, has no latency, uh, and is infinitely fast, um, and the services that are running on top of it. So the microservices approach looks good. It gives us runtime technology independence. It provides a simple model for distributed deployment, uh, and it makes the scaling of individual services, or per-service scaling, quite simple to achieve. But the real problem remains, which is you can't look inside one of these black boxes here like that one, which might have orchestration in it, and see what it does. The only way to see what it does is have up-to-date documentation that somebody wrote, and they have kept up-to-date, and they're willing to give you, and you know who they are to ask them. So I love virtualization. I love software to find everything. I love all that stuff. But basically, the way we write apps, the way we put them on infrastructure has not actually changed all that much over the last, well, quite a lot of years. Uh, and that's the problem I want to address. So can I just get a show of hands, because you are actually listening, and I'm really pleased about that. Who understands what I'm saying so far, and, and would anybody disagree with any of it? Are we getting hands up? OK. No violent disagreement at this point. OK. So let's explore the black boxes a little further. Here we have, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, so I, uh, the question was, um, 
how, what is the business perspective of the black box and why does it matter? Would that be a good way of putting it? Okay, so the black box issue to the business is I, the chief exec, can't change how these black boxes work and I fear to change anything surrounding them. If you were to go to a, I mean, and you know this probably, if you go to a big enterprise and you say, are there any systems you don't know why they're there? You'll get the answer, yeah, there are loads of systems and I know uh, that I have no idea why they're there. Like, I have no idea what that robot is doing right there. <laughs> I don't dare touch it, right? So I'm in the same position as somebody who's running one of these businesses. I'm leaving it alone. It says it's returning to the charging station, and I don't even know I believe that. So there's a fairly classic black box. I don't know what it's doing, and I'm leaving it alone. And that's how people feel uh, with systems in, uh, in, in their business. So the black box issue for the business is, I do not know what these things do. And to be absolutely blunt, I don't know what half these people are doing, and I don't know why I'm paying them so much money. Uh, and that broadly is it, OK? OK, but let's just get a bit more technical. So looking at the, um, looking at the black box swamp, one black box is not a problem. Two black boxes is a bit of a problem. By the time you've got five, let's discuss what, what we can do about this. So I want you to answer for me three questions, right? Um, the first question is, I don't know if you can see, these events have got numbers written on them, right? So um, uh, let me just get to the right place. I want to say the right thing here. Yeah. Uh, let's pretend that I have given you all the most advanced traffic snooping uh, and detection uh, capability, the most, the most expensive technology available on the planet. Um, and after a week's training, so I have given all of you one whole week's training, uh, you have deployed the, the tool against the system I'm showing up here. Uh, and you've extracted, using your skill, uh, a log of events. Uh, now, please look carefully at this log. It's up there. And it's showing uh, a list of events, numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, which run between the systems, right? You can do this because you're a network engineer and you've got sniffing tools. So using your skill and judgment, please answer the following questions. Question number one, was it message one, this one here, or was it message two, that's the second message to have occurred, that caused message three, to occur. Can I have your answers, please? OK. That's not very good. Um, you can't answer that question, right? So second question, what else could have caused message three to occur? We have an answer. One or two, it might just be some direct communication between C and D. Right? Yeah, damn it. It could be an unrelated direct communication between C and D. So that might be it. It could be there's a timer in that system, and it went ping at the wrong moment and caused a message to occur. Absolutely. We don't know, right? Um, question three, and this is the one that matters to the business. Um, do we actually need service D? It's a very hard one to answer. I mean, there's stuff going to it, right? Um, uh, and what I don't want to do is remove it unless I'm sure that I don't need that thing. You can't answer it. So the problem with back black boxes is that network engineers may well be asked to look at the traffic and tell, tell the business what systems matter, but you really can't. Um, now, this choreography obviously is trivial, but if you consider any enterprise, it's got not not six messages, it's got millions of messages moving between systems. And remember I said in, in one bank, six and a half thousand systems? Six and a half thousand systems. And the choreography between them makes this look like, looks like nothing. That's the problem we're facing. So the question that I have is, you know, the network engineer not answering that question, big deal, you know. Can the developers of these apps, you know, can they provide the documentation to answer these questions? Yeah, what a great question. Right. So the, 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 the point being made there is the network engineers can't answer that question. I mean, have you network engineers ever been asked that question? Has anybody ever been? You've been asked that question. Oh, my God. Right. OK. You can't answer it. Uh, so you have to say, I can't answer it. The question is, do the application developers have the documentation that enables them to answer it? And of course they haven't. I mean, do you really think they have kept documentation from systems that are 20 years old plus? Some of these things are running COBOL. No, they don't have it. So, so that is a, a, re, a, a big problem. 
So because choreography of this sort is so universal um, and so completely opaque, you can look any enterprise IT guy in the eye uh, and say with perfect correctness, you don't know what half your system, let's say a quarter of your systems are doing or why they're there. So, we have this, we have the black box swamp, and that's the problem we're facing. This stands in the way of three business requirements, and this is us, we are standing in the way of three business requirements, which are agility, flexibility, and worst of all now, conduct risk. Conduct risk is a problem that costs one bank $20 billion in two years. That one bank was JP Morgan. That is the cost of conduct risk in fines, fines from regulators, because of their transactional errors. So this is the scale of the problem that we, as professionals, are failing to address. Um, and that's, that's why I'm introducing this subject. So think what virtualization means for business. It means they produce these black boxes quicker. We produce more of these things. We do it automatically. We don't have to unplug the boxes. We just create them. Um, and compared to what's coming, even that is nothing. We haven't even begun this black box swamp. Because all I need to do is take this picture that you recognized from earlier, replace the word service with the word thing, use the word internet, because we have an internet of things, and the black box problem is now on a scale not of six and a half thousand systems for one enterprise, it's on the scale of billions for all of us. So I hope you get the idea of the scale of what it is I'm trying to talk about today. That's actually the end of the scripted bit, you see, because what I wanted to, to do was develop a story and kind of get you engaged with it, and then uh, explain to you how we are, are producing one way of dealing with this, we think, but also uh, engage you to say, uh, to criticize uh, and come up with your own thoughts. Uh, so at this point, I'm, I'm going to start going free form. So I want to talk to you now about clear boxes. So do you remember this slide we saw earlier, which is about microservices, the divide and conquer, the ability to scale independently. Each service has its own stack, and it's deployed independently. That's a good approach. And we also mentioned that the combination of those boxes might constitute one app or another app. So I've just drawn a dotted line around some of these boxes to indicate that they constitute an app. And I've left the network at the bottom. So at the moment, we're just leaving the perfect network with 100% reliability, no latency, and infinite, uh, infinite speed, just for the minute. And then do you remember the other thing I said, which is about which of these services constitutes something that is an app? You know, is orchestration in that one? Do these two have choreography between them? Uh, and if I change the service, what breaks? Do I need it? Now, with the clear box, and this is the technology I'm going to demonstrate to you and talk you through, uh, so prepare to get a bit more techie. Um, the approach we take to this is we say, let's create a configuration tree. And in that configuration tree, we will represent which of those services, the black boxes, uh, are to be combined to form an application. What we don't do is put that knowledge, put that orchestration inside one of the individual boxes. We have an external configuration tree. That tree is actually inside this thing we call the sequencing engine. And that's the thing which orchestrates uh, boxes to become an application. And when I say application, it might be a transaction or a business service or something of that sort, but, but basically a sequence of events. I now want to, I, I'm going to ask you to concentrate now. So I'm now going to show you what such a clear box can look like. So I want you to have in your heads this vision of a sequencing engine, a bit like a router, but it's not a router, it's a, an engine that runs somewhere on the uh, enterprise infrastructure. Um, this is a clear box here, uh, and it orchestrates one system, <laughs> which isn't much orchestration, right? Uh, but basically, this is what a clear box ping looks like. So imagine the sequencing engine is here, there is a system, and we ping. 
this is the markup that does it. So this is a piece of configuration markup that says we have a mix. And by mix, I mean a mix of capabilities, like request replies and what have you, um, and intents, which in this case is all we have. We have an output of a ping, and we want a ping back. Um, we declare a service, which is an HTTP service. We declare a field, ping. That's the third thing down on that uh, XML list. And we have one thing called a solicit response. So we have declared in the configuration a capability, which is I intend to get a ping back. Solicit, and I want a response. And you can imagine that occurring over the list of those services that I showed you earlier. But there's only one. And the one service is that thing called a manual form. Um, what happens in the sequencing engine with this mix is that the field here called ping goes into the sequencing engine. The sequencing engine says, aha, that, that service wants a ping back. And it immediately just sends ping back, because it's, it's got ping, right? In other words, it's saying, have I got what's needed to satisfy the response? And the answer is it has, because it's one field. So that's pretty trivial. And that is the, the most trivial uh, clear box I can come up with. Now, I want to reassure you at this point. I am going to show you a clear box that drives a robot car. Okay? This is not driving a robot car. This is a ping. But the point is the representation of the capability and the representation of the data that moves between systems. Let's just take it one step further. I'm going to demo this one. I'll talk you through it first, and then I'll demo it. Okay. So here's a clear box which does a round trip. There is something which says, I want this, please. A service says, oh, I can do that, and does it. And then the sequencing engine delivers the answer back to the thing which said, I want this, please. In this case, ping goes out and Pong comes back, but a request reply over here is able to deliver the Pong in response to the original ping. So it goes like this, OK? Ping goes into the sequencing engine. The sequencing engine says, ah, oh, I'll give that ping to this service here. Ping goes in to the service. That service responds with Pong comes out. And that Pong is now in the sequencing engine. It says, Pong back to the original requester. Two systems, right? But what we're doing is not just taking an API and expressing a request reply. We're also expressing, and this is really important, the inverse, the mirror, the solicit response. Ping, I give it out, and I want a Pong back. And then the request reply does, ping, I'll give you a Pong. Do you see what I mean? They're paired together. Now, normally, when we are programmers, what we do is we program to these things here request reply APIs. In the sequencing engine, you express both. You express the out followed by the in, but you also express the API, the in followed by the out, like what a server does, right? Here, um, we've actually done something practical, amazingly enough, because we said that this ping here, the solicit response, is on an HTTP form. OK, so an HTTP form does that. Um, but the server, the service itself, this thing here, is a WebSocket. So even with this really trivial clear box, we've achieved something useful, which is a protocol translator. Hurrah! We talk HTTP to a WebSocket server, and the WebSocket server doesn't need to be upgraded to understand HTTP. So that's got to be good, right? Very simple um, and a very straightforward operation. What you're looking at there is the configuration just rendered of a sequencing engine config. So now I need you to keep focusing. I'm now going to tell you exactly what that configuration looks like in XML. So remember, this configuration goes into the sequencing engine. The sequencing engine understands both the solicit response and the request reply. It has both sides of the conversation, not just one side. Um, and if you look at it, you can see that we call it, at the top, a mix. In the sequencing engine, what we do is we do not write a program. We mix together the capabilities, which are solicit responses and request replies, and we let the sequencing engine work out what is the sequence of events that delivers the response that's being asked for. In other words, given the capabilities, what is the sequence of events 
that enables the intent to be met. So we have intent, we have capabilities. Capabilities are almost always APIs. If you look, for example, at that WebSocket thing that I mentioned, that's marked up in the sequencing engine as configuration that you can go and look at. It's just a piece of XML or JSON or whatever. It's a tree, right? And it says, there is a service. Its name is WebSocket. Its type is tab server, whatever that is. It might be Docker. It might be, it doesn't matter what it is. It has a property, which is the source code. I'm going to show you that in a minute, just so you can see how to write these things. Um, and that's the end of the service. And if you look down below, if you have a look at that thing which says request reply, name equals Pong, that refers to the service at the top called WebSocket. So when I talk about this line here, from that operation, that request reply, up to that server there, that's represented in the XML by that little line there. The service that implements this request reply is that WebSocket service there. Now, this could just be documentation. It could just be, oh, this is a documentation of what services we have and the operations they have. That's fine. But, and, and in fact, it is just documentation. It's just a tree, right? But what the sequencing engine does is it actually executes this as well. It executes it not because you write a program. It executes it because it infers the possible sequence of events and just does it. So that's the point of the glass box. It's configuration. You can look at the configuration. It expresses everything that participates in a orchestration, uh, and it makes it work. So now I need you to still concentrate. I'll demo this in a minute. Um, we need to look at the JavaScript itself, which does that little service. So uh, here I refer to roundtrip.js. I've got the exact same mix on the left-hand side, no change, the same thing. Here's roundtrip.js referenced. Here is the JavaScript itself, OK? So this is very similar to a microservice pattern. What you've got is something which expresses a request reply. In fact, it says uh, pong. Pong is a function of request reply. I ignore the request. I don't take any notice of it. I just say reply dot set OK, that's the output set, um, and set the value of the field called Pong to JavaScript say cheese. I have no idea why JavaScript say cheese, but that's the response which comes back. Um, and then what do we do? We send the response. And you might ask, well, what's the, what's the protocol over which that happens? Well, do you know, it doesn't matter. It might be a message queue, it might be TCP IP, it might be, you know, it could be a salty wet string for all I care. But that's what it does. That's the declaration, the capability, and there's the implementation. Now, um, there's one other aspect of this I want to point out. When the sequencing engine has these capabilities and intents expressed in it, it decides what to do, right? So it can say, oh, I'll start executing. And at some point, it'll say, oh, I need to run that request reply, which is the Pong request reply. And then it says, oh, my god. But there is no service to do that. And it pauses at that point and says, aha, maybe, just maybe, at the moment it's needed, I can provision that service. And this is the key link that I want to make between application logical flow and data center automation. Because what we have put in here is some markup. Provisioning. This is how you provision the service. It's called WebSocket, but here's how we provision it. And it's provisioned as a transaction elsewhere. It's another clear box, actually, but don't worry about that. And at the moment it's needed, the sequencing engine goes away, runs that provisioning transaction, brings up the service, and uses it to do the Pong. So you're like, I didn't have to stand anything up in advance. It stood it up just exactly at the second it was required. That's a great result. But remember, the more important result, really, is that you've got a clear box saying what's going on. What I want to do is just show you that. So are you OK to see a demo? Are you still concentrating? I'm sensing people are watching, watching carefully. So that's good. Right, let's have a look here. I might need to sign in again. 
What I'm showing you here is the management screen of a sequencing engine. And the sequencing engine is running locally on here. Um, this thing can run inside a uh, Cisco router. It can run on UCSE. It can run in a Raspberry Pi if you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a very tight piece of code, just like a router. But it's not a router. It's a sequencing engine. That example we saw was this one here, look, round trip. Does that look familiar? You may recall there is a form here which says ping. Um, and there is a WebSocket server which returns a Pong. So we got the client and we got the server represented in the same clear box. Um, and I will now execute the ping. And I have got the result. JavaScript say cheese. It worked. So that bit of JavaScript worked. And it says JavaScript say cheese. But did you notice the more important thing that happened? Even though the service, that request reply service, was not stood up, it had not been provisioned, no engineer had gone and made it exist, no Linux box had been started, um, nonetheless, the sequencing engine provisioned a server. And it provisioned a server because it needed it. And there is a really key point. I can now say this server here was provisioned with reason. That server was provisioned because of the ping transaction. And this is a real step. Because what we have done is we have tied together the automation of the data center with the logical step, which is why that piece of data center needed to be brought up. In this case, it was a tab server. It could have been a Linux server. It could have been a Docker container. It could have been a firewall hole. It doesn't matter what it was. The point is, it was provisioned with reason. I just want to pause at that point and see if you've got the importance of that. What we've done is we've bridged the gap between infrastructure and application. The infrastructure is not separate. You don't do it separately. The infrastructure is provisioned at the millisecond it's needed. There are two good things about this. The first thing is, just-in-time provisioning. OK, well, that's kind of good for cost reasons, da 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 But when I've been talking to customers about this stuff, they say, oh, we don't care about that. We're rich. Uh, well, the banks say that. Uh, the reason we care is with reason. We know why it's been provisioned. And there's an audit log to say it. Uh, let me show you the audit log. This is a separate little um, node, a little sequencing engine node. It's actually not doing sequencing. It's just looking at the event log. There we go, an event log. Uh, stuff on there, almost unbelievably detailed. Here is a response event, a reply event. Every request every reply, every solicit, every response, every bit of provisioning, everything that occurs is logged. The, the volume of that data that's generated by the sequencing engine is enormous. I can't tell you. So it needs to go into, guess what, Splunk. Um, but the result is that you have got an audit trail of absolutely everything that occurred, not merely in respect of the application flow. And that's useful, right? Not merely that but in respect of the individual data center artifacts that were provisioned to service that flow. Not provisioned because an engineer did it randomly, provisioned to service that flow. This enables big enterprises to answer a question they are absolutely unable to answer at the moment, which is, what systems am I using and why they stood up? And that's the point of the clear box. So, what I'd like to do now is show you uh, that this technique of configuration instead of programming at an appropriate level also bears fruit in more complex transactions. So a request reply is not necessarily all that interesting, right? We can do a bit better than that. Uh, so what I'll show you is how to drive a car with configuration and no programming. Here we go. We're on the same sequencing engine. And I'm going to look at this mix here, which is a robot car driver. Let's shrink it down a bit. 
I'll explain how this works. I think I'll make it work first. But you can see it's not very complex. I'm going to fire up a web page that uh, is itself unable to drive a robot car. Okay, It is merely the definition of a robot car. Um, but it's automatically started driving, my god, the moment I started it up. And as part of the startup, what it did was it placed an intent on the sequencing engine, say, please, I want to turn on. I want to start driving. The sequencing engine took that intent and tried to satisfy it. It satisfied it using a set of capabilities I'm about to show you. One of those capabilities involved a service which wasn't running. So there was no compute service running for this thing. Um, and here it is. It's just started up. And in fact, if you look, at, you can see it's sort of scrolling up. And the effect of this configuration in the sequencing engine is to drive the robot car towards the light. And just to prove the point, uh, it's bumping a bit. I'll move the light down here. And you can see it's driving towards the light. Now, I'll just move that so that it's running in its own window for a bit. And let's look at the mix, OK? I'll shrink it down a touch and just move that up here. The thing I want to show you is the way this is factored. And this is the clear box, OK? So this is a clear box. It's causing things to collaborate that drive the robot car. We've got a robot here which is a folder, and it encloses all of those items, including the motors and sensors and a very primitive compute capability. I can't tell you how primitive that is. I'll show you if you want to see it later. Those are the capabilities. The intent is up there, and the intent does nothing. It just says, turn on. So that's the only intent, turn on. This thing never stops. It just drives forever. Um, and the result is, as you can see, we've got a driving car. Let's now explore one or two of the other benefits of doing things this way. I've not written a black box program. There is no program here. One thing I can do is I can look at the metrics of this thing. Without looking at the details, what I'm seeing is all the metrics associated with every one of the operations that's running. This matters to a business. Those five systems communicate in order to perform some business function. And here's how each of them performs. That's useful. That's worth knowing. So we're getting those metrics, and they're presented in an identical way, regardless of the black box services which are collaborating in the orchestration. Another benefit is that we had that automatic start of the service. So the compute service started automatically. And that wasn't started in advance. I hadn't started that in advance. And we're able to drive the robot car. Um, so. Uh, you can see that the ability to construct, I can't shut this thing down. It keeps restarting it. Let's shut that down. There we go. The ability to construct processes using this abstraction is surprisingly powerful. A lot of people would say, you can't do workflows without writing a workflow. And I say to you, yes, you can. You can write a workflow without writing a workflow. Because the sequencing engine takes the, the mix of capabilities and intent and creates a workflow out of it. Normally, we have program plus config. With this thing, we have config, and that's all. There's one other demo I can give you, which is much more complicated. This one involves SDN, OK? So I reckon you're up for this. I'm going to show you topology, SDN, services, and application logic all tied together in one abstraction. Are you OK for this? OK. Uh, here it is. So I'm going to show you a tree here for a fictional bank I've called Acme.com. And this represents uh, a set of services on a service-oriented architecture and a topology, which is a fairly straightforward topology. The topology looks like this. I'll add some detail to it. Something I want to point out to you is that this topology is represented in the exact same clear box configuration as the services we've seen earlier, and we're going to see some more, and the operations we saw earlier, and we're going to see some more. So one abstraction, a clear box abstraction for topology, for services, and for logic. In this case, we're looking at three routers, which are called uh, NDE core, EC, and US. So we've got 
uh, three locations of corporate land. Some stuff has to happen in the US, some stuff ha has to happen in the uh, EC location. Let's go up a level. Let's go into the ledger services. So this is the definition of what might appear on a service-oriented architecture. We can see some services like sales system, uh, a write-off ledger, uh, bank, oh, how boring, OK? This is so close to the business. This is the sort of stuff business people care about. Um, and finally, we've got a mix. So here's a mix which has got one intent. The intent is, please process a receipt of money from a debtor against three ledgers, three distributed ledgers on our distributed systems, looking out on the sales system, whether it's a full or a partial payment, and doing three two-phase commits against those ledgers. So we're right up in programming land now. Now, you could write this in Java or something, and it would be oop, a lot of Java. The entire mix to do this transaction looks like this. So that is it. You're looking at it. That's a clear box. Nobody has written a program to do this transaction. This is configuration, and it's a clear box. Um, and I'll run the transaction. Let's just, let's just see what happens. The moment I start running the transaction, you can see that services start popping up. Now, I'm doing this for demo purposes, right? So I have popped up services. I've stood them up in the, in the infrastructure to do the bank ledger, the write-off ledger, the debtor's ledger, the sales system, the, you name it. So those systems have all been stood up just because they were needed for this one transaction. Um, and the sequencing engine has completed a full payment. So that transaction has completed. But here's an interesting thing. One of those services, the bank US service, actually, had a dependency on that topology. And the dependency was, I need to run on the US LAN, and I need a path opened up using SDN control to that US LAN for the purposes of this transaction. Um, and that actually occurred. And it's run the SDN path setup which is a series of hops against uh, routers, of one of which I'm looking at here. So I can do, say, uh, show, I've used 1PK for this, uh, which is, uh, they're deprecating it. We have to move to a REST-based thing uh, and YANG configuration soon. Uh, but if we look at this, we can see there is a session which the Sparkle sequencing engine has opened to the router. And the router has duly been controlled, and a path has been set up across that topology. But think about it now, what's happened. That path, which was set up across this topology, was correct in respect of that one transaction, its jurisdiction, its priority against other transactions, and the cost of the path, the cheapest possible path was set up. Better than that, when that was done, it was logged. So an audit trail has been made to say this path was set up in every one of the hops across it. And even better than that, the path is torn down after it's finished with. So you've got this capability for automatically controlling the data center uh, artifacts right the way from network all the way up to Linux instances, within Linux instances to Docker containers or whatever, within the context of a running transaction. And that's the point of the clear box method of expressing transactions and orchestrating services. Do, do we have any questions at this point? So if you're doing like 50 of those transactions at the exact same time, is it spinning up 50 different services, or is it? OK, here's the question. Uh, if you're doing 50 of those transactions at the same time, is it spinning up 50 of those services? Let's just do a quick test of that. Let's run another transaction. Uh, so we'll go back up to here to our little test. Harness, we'll run transaction number two. You can see there's a little pause. One extra service got stood up. The other ones were reused. So now if it's already stood up, it's used. So you've got the concept of the piece of configuration which defines the service, and then the instance of the service itself. If the instance is already there, we're good. Um, one other thing I want to point out is that the service in this case, interestingly, is a meta service. Uh, it was actually a pool, and behind the pool, all expressed in the markup, were either an EC or a US instance of a bank. And in the case of the um, routers which were being controlled, once an instance was created of control, that's it. it it's, it stops there.
a, a very good question. Okay, uh, let me just go back to the Prezzo here. So here's what we've achieved here. We have unified flow with automation. The intents express what you want to happen. The capabilities express what can be done. Capabilities maps to APIs, APIs on services. Intents are new. It's very unusual to express intents. Normally what happens is programmers write exactly what to happen. There is no expression of intent. But now we have intent, we have capability, and the sequencer matches the two together. When we talk about services, I want to be really clear. We don't necessarily mean we stand up new stuff every time. It could be stuff is already running. It might be what we mean is opening a firewall just for the three and a half milliseconds that it's needed for a transaction or request reply to occur, and then we close the firewall again. So it might be that. So services can be literal services, or they can be meta, abstract, or virtual. It doesn't matter. As far as the sequencing engine is concerned, so long as it's able to control it, that's good enough. And with the level of software-defined control we're now experiencing, as you know, that's an increasing potential. The Sparkle sequencing engine, which is our product, and it's our approach to this whole problem, is to determine sequence, drive the flow of events, that's an orchestrated flow of events, and here's the really important thing, log everything. So we no longer have black boxes, we no longer have mystery. We now have exact log, everything that happened, and the ability to answer the regulator's questions, if you're a bank, or a health service, or a government organization, which previously you simply could not answer. All of this you could do with programming, don't get me wrong. And in many cases, that's the best way to do it. It's just that the black box swamp that we're heading for, which is about to get infinitely worse, is solved if you use the approach of clear boxes. We've seen how Clearbox Config can drive a robot car. I've shown you how Clearbox Config can do complex transactions and manage topology. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much indeed.